Hello, my name is Stuart Hines and I am the curator of special collections and archives here at the Buddy Special Collections at the Miller Nichols Library of UMKC. And I want to give you a little tour of the Buddy Special Collections. The name comes from Dr. Kenneth J. Labuddy. Dr. Labuddy was the director of this library from 1950 to 1985 and he was a rare books person and he was really interested in rare books and he spent a lot of his time helping to build the rare book collection here in Special Collections because we are comprised of three different types of materials. We are a rare book collection, we are home to archival papers and manuscripts, and we are home to university archives, so everything historical about UMKC. Each of those collections has a specific uh, strengths and a specific focus. The rare book collection is primarily a Western Americana collection, Trans Mississippi West, um, late 19th century with a particular emphasis on Kansas and Missouri. Within the manuscript materials, we tend to collect in the performing arts of Kansas City, uh, in large part because of the presence of the conservatory, but also because of the presence of the Mars Sound Archive, which is in our division in a different location in our building, because a lot of the donations that are made either to Labuddy or to Mar are focused, of course, on music. And, as I mentioned, University Archives focuses on the history of UMKC. So, uh, we are a closed collection, and what that means is there are no shelves for you to browse through. It's, it's um, all uh, not accessible to our users uh, directly. So what you end up doing is using access tools, things like a finding aid or a catalog record to discover what it is that we have here. You use um, processes to request those materials, and then we retrieve those materials for you, and you engage with the folks at the service desk to, to get your hands on that stuff, and then you use it in this space. Um, 99 times out of 100, you can capture images of the stuff um, as you're using it. That's essentially the logistics of how um, the operation functions. I did want to point out that also housed in this space is the Edgar Snow Reading Room. Edgar Snow was a Kansas City born journalist. Um, he was a print journalist and he connected with uh, Mao Zedong um, during the Chinese Revolution. And he reported on Mao's activities favorably and as a result is revered now and has been revered for decades in China. And his uh, papers live here in Labuddy Special Collections and um, uh, in remembrance of Snow's uh, interest in China and fostering good relationships, there are a number of organizations that are involved in perpetuating not only his memory but also perpetuating, uh, strengthening those ties between in, in particular Kansas City and China. And uh, one of those organizations is the Edgar Snow Memorial Foundation and they helped to support the uh, construction of the Edgar Snow Reading Room here in our space. And so I want to take some time to show you um, some of the really cool things that we have here in Special Collections. It's one thing for me to stand here and talk about it, it's another to actually see some stuff. So let's go look at some material. Working with archival collections takes a long time to get them processed and organized in a way um, that makes them accessible to users like yourselves. And it, that work happens in this space. Um, we, we moved into this uh, renovated space in 2015 and um, we have slowly filled it up with the work that it takes to get this stuff accessible to you all. This is a portion of our collections, of all three different types of collections, book, manuscript material, and down there some university archive stuff. Um, you can't tell it on the video, but the uh, instant you walk into the room, you can uh, sense that it is climate controlled. The temperature and the humidity are kept stable, which is the best thing that you can do for long-term preservation of paper-based materials, which um, just about all this stuff is. The material that's in here is frequently used. It's it's used either because we know it gets requested often because it's a popular item. It gets assigned in coursework. Um, we work with a lot of different types of faculty to develop assignments 
that um, are specifically focused on a collection or an individual item um, in special collections. And so because we know that stuff's going to see some traffic, we put it in this space as well. And then further back um, are some materials that are waiting to be processed, or so our backlog, essentially. The manuscript collections are um, arranged by uh, name of the, the donor uh, or the person that was responsible, the person or the entity that was responsible for generating the material. So it's typically named after an individual or an organization or a business or whatever it was that generated the stuff. Within our manuscript collecting, we tend, like as I mentioned, we tend to focus on the performing arts and music in particular. And so what I wanted to do was show you some of the incredible the range of the music resources that we have here. Um, so for example, this is, this is a, a manuscript chant book. Um, we believe from about the 14th through the 16th centuries, maybe a little later, maybe 15th through 17th. Um, but it, it, what's interesting about it, it is, is that it is a chant book that is made up of pieces of other chant books. It came to us from a convent in Spain. And just as today, um, the convent's women-oriented organizations didn't have a lot of money, and so they would grab these chant books from wherever they could, and they put it together themselves. And you can see this, this page varies greatly from this page, and this is obviously from something that's been damaged. This particular item is uh, part of a campus interdisciplinary multispectral scanning project. They're using all different types of forms of light to do different uh, types of scanning on these pages, and they're finding out all sorts of really, really amazing information. They were they just received, I think, their third grant, and the the latest one was in the amount of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to um, to further the research on this particular object. So, as I mentioned, this, it takes a long time to get the stuff in a manuscript collection organized, and once it does, it looks like this. It, the stuff goes into folders, and the folders go into boxes, and then an invent, uh, basically an inventory is created telling you what's in what folder, in what box. We call that inventory a finding aid in Archives Land. So you'll see a finding aid that says in box 68, folder 3 of the Paul Creston collection are music programs that he collected from performances that he attended. It's one thing to see that listed in an inventory on a PDF. It's another to actually see the range of programs that Creston, who was a mid 20th century American composer, uh, collected, as I said, from the um, events that he attended. I like to show students that we have scores uh, and arrangements that were done by hand. They do everything on a computer now. There are a number of different types of uh, software that will allow them to compose using a computer as opposed to doing it by hand. So it's always fun to show them uh, something like this, which is an arrangement that was done by Buck Clayton, who was a 1920s uh, jazz band leader and arranger. Just to, just to uh, indicate to them that it can be done <laughs> by hand and not on a computer. These are um, some samples from a larger collection of um, Western composers' autographs. Um, they're quite remarkable. The students love to see these. This is a letter from Claire Schumann. This is a little note from Frederick Chopin. When I show these to conservatory graduate students, they're in awe. They just can't believe that these documents are at their school. Similarly, uh, this is a combination of both. A uh, handwritten uh, arrangement of the Star Spangled Banner by Igor Stravinsky, signed by him, and then uh, a headshot of Stravinsky um, from the World War II era. So, obviously, stuff that, that is directly related to music, but there's also a wide range of material in the collection that is indirectly, more indirectly related to music. Um, material that came from people who sold music. So lots of advertising, um, advertising posters and um, gugas and, and trinkets related to um, the sale and distribution of recorded music uh, here in Kansas City. These all came from um, a local record store and people who promoted music. So posters, 
that promote specific events. Um, obviously, these both took place uh, mid 20th century at Municipal Auditorium. I believe my colleague Chuck Haddix can tell us exactly the day and year that these concerts happened. So, uh, in addition to uh, collecting around performing arts, uh, we also have a lot of stuff around Kansas City Theater uh, and film. Um, we are collecting in areas um, from communities that are traditionally underrepresented in archives. So, uh, the local African American community, the local Latinx community, um, women, and where we have seen um, the, we've seen some really phenomenal success in each of those areas, but where we're seeing the most traction is collecting from Kansas City's LGBT communities um, under the umbrella of what we call the Gay and Lesbian Archive of America, GLAMA. Uh, it's 11 years old now, and uh, this is uh, where the stuff from GLAMA lives. Um, a lot of it's out for research now. Um, but we've got a whole another aisle of stuff in the backlog. It's, there's that much stuff that's, that's come in. And we've clearly struck a nerve with a community that wants to preserve its history. And we've seen some um, incredible donations and some incredible work come out of the resources in Glamour. They're becoming more and more popular each year. Students are really drawn to this hidden history and want to do um, projects that help uncover it and bring it to light. And I also pulled some things that are uh, representative of uh, some of the material in Glamour. Um, a lot of stuff, um, my own personal research interest, the history of female impersonation in Kansas City. Um, these are articles from the Kansas City Journal Post, uh, September of 1925, when this performer, Carol Norman, was in town uh, performing at the Orpheum, um, which was a theater down at 12th and Baltimore. And it's kind of uh, eye-opening to 21st century viewers that in 1925 they would feature uh, a half-page image of uh, a drag queen, essentially, um, and an article about how her mother um, uh, her mother picked the, the clothes uh, that she wore and then a sample of the many, many pieces of uh, sheet music that featured Carol Norman and other uh, female impersonators during the period. Jumping ahead uh, to the 1960s, many people uh, remember the Jewel Box, which was over on Truce, 3219 Truce. And this is um, a love poster, not a love letter, but a love poster to Skip Arnold that was put together by uh, this gentleman, Horace Holmes. Skip was a very well-loved uh, female impersonator here in town, worked at the Jewel Box and worked at the Colony this is Skip along with some of the other Jewel Box performers. He started he started in Florida but relocated here um, and spent um, the rest of his life in Kansas City. Like I said, performed at the Jewel Box and then as more venues opened up in the 70s and 80s, he performed at some of those clubs as well. Lots of stuff around activism and political work. And this is an example of a scrapbook. Um, put together by this woman, Leah Hopkins. She uh, was an activist, is still around, and is still an activist. She's also an author. She uh, founded the Christopher Street uh, Association in, in 1977, which was uh, a gay activist group that fortuitously was formed um, just before the uh, anti-gay Anita Bryant visited Kansas City following her um, success in overturning human rights ordinances in Miami in that summer in 77. So lots of stuff from Leah. Uh, lots of magazines and publications, uh, national, local, and regional. Um, this is just an old issue of The Advocate, which looks very different now. And then lots of um, sort of unexpected ephemera. Um, in this case, uh, uh, Larry Sullivan's uh, collection of, of buttons. This is from back in the day where instead of giving things a thumbs up or a thumbs down, you actually uh, indicated your support by wearing it on your person. And these are just some a sample of the wide range of things that he was interested in. So in this space is, as I said, where a portion of the collection lives. Our collection is much, much bigger than this. And so let me show you where the rest of the collection lives.
So in this climate controlled space, it's where the remainder of our collection and the bulk of the library's collection lives. It's our automated storage and retrieval system, our ASRS, um, what we would call colloquially the robot. And it is uh, a robotic storage system um, that is clearly high density and allows for maximization of of space and uh, as far as special collections goes our book co our book collection lives here and um, the majority of our manuscript materials live in here as well and i wanted to show you how stuff actually gets pulled from this space so users of the catalog punch in a title in our case, I will punch in this title, The Independent, which is a society magazine that's been around for over 100 years. And then this little gray button that says Pick Up at Miller Nichols. When I click on that, I want to request the whole journal. And then I can put my name in. And when I, when I click Request, that fires up the robot and that makes it work. We're looking at the back of the robotic end of things. This is essentially a robotic cherry picker. And what it will do is it will pull out one of these metal bins that has the book that I requested in it. And then it will deliver it to me and I'm coming here. And it will slide it off. Once it starts wobbling. And then the robot software will tell me uh, exactly which one was requested and then the human interface will go in and pull the actual item and uh, check it out from the robot and put it out there ready for you to come and use. So that's how the robot works. Like I said, the bulk of the library's uh, bound uh, collection is in here, bound periodicals and books, a lot of microforms, microfilm and microfiche. In these two aisles and then in this aisle, this aisle holds specifically uh, units that were designed to house archival materials. I'll show you what I mean. So I just requested a box of stuff from a particular collection and it's going to go pull the shelving unit that has that box. The way that it knows that information is by barcode. Everything that's in here has a barcode and the barcode is what links the software that runs the robot to the software that runs the library catalog. That's how they talk to each other is by barcode number. Um, and so it knows where that barcode lives and it's pulling the shelving unit that has the box with that barcode. And then it will slide the whole unit onto those with that yellow platform. And then the staff person can go to either side of the shelving unit and retrieve the specific box that was requested. And again, take it out there for users like yourselves. So that's where our collection lives in those two spaces. And it's used out in the space that we started. Thank you very much for your interest in Lobetti Special Collections. Visit us at library.umkc.edu and learn more about the types of collections that we have, the types of materials that we have, and how we can get them into your hands. Thanks again.